Welcome to the Retool Biomechanics course. By this point, you should have already viewed the anatomy course, and now we're going to take those anatomical landmarks and attach muscles to those bones and see how they start to articulate while our riders are pedaling on their bike. To understand biomechanics, we have to understand how muscles affect joints. We will define these key terms, contraction, flexion, and extension. Muscles primarily do one thing, they contract. The muscle fibers shorten between their attachment points. Depending on where those muscles are located and how they attach around a joint, they can have different effects. Flexion is the closing of an angle at the joint. In this example, the biceps contract, causing flexion at the elbow. Conversely, extension is the opening of the angle at a joint. This example shows the triceps contracting, resulting in elbow extension. The quadriceps are the largest muscle grouping in the body, for good reason. They are responsible for propelling us forward by extending the knee. The four quadricep muscles join at the quadricep tendon, which passes over the patella, attaching at the tibial tuberosity as the patella tendon. It is important to note, there is a lot of force created by the quads that has to be applied to the lower leg through these tendons. Overuse and malalignment can cause pain, discomfort, and injury to this area. The other driver for pedaling our bike is the gluteus maximus. We like to refer to the glute as the wattage cottage, since it is responsible for extending the hip through the power phase of the pedal stroke. The hamstring's primary responsibility while cycling is knee flexion, the recovery phase. However, the hamstring is active throughout the entire pedal stroke, working in hip extension and medial lateral knee stability. Gastrox are not power producers, but stabilize the foot. They are responsible for plantar flexing the foot during the pedal stroke, making sure the foot stays as firm as possible while the much bigger glutes and quads are pushing down hard on the pedals through extension. Since the pedaling system is inherently inefficient, bike fit must work towards maximizing efficiency. This diagram represents a study of multiple athletes using force vector pedals. Force vector pedals can measure how much force is applied to the pedal and in which direction. The length of the arrow is indicative of the amount of force and points in the direction, or vector, of the force being applied. The most amount of force is being applied when the glutes and quads are contracting simultaneously to extend the lower leg. Their combined force is most directly applied around the forward horizontal position, through sections 4 through 6. In order to use a lever most effectively, you would want to apply the force at a right angle or tangentially to the end of the lever. Ideally, the rider would apply tangential force all the way around the pedal stroke, but that is not possible. So we aim to optimize force application where it is greatest by aligning the rider's knee over the pedal in this forward horizontal position, as close to the tangent as possible. We believe this is the safest and most effective way to align the joint for power production. You will notice that there is still a downward force being applied to the pedals during the backside or recovery portion of the pedal stroke. Why is that? Remember, the rider is attached to opposing crank arms bilaterally. When this side of the crank is in recovery, the other side is in the power phase. The rider's larger glutes and quads are extending with greater force and acceleration than the smaller recovery muscles responsible for hip and knee flexion. The rider's leg is basically two large levers, thigh and shin, and one short lever made up of many bones, the foot. Malalignment at the knee is typically caused by a lack of support at the foot or the hip. Next, we will cover why it is beneficial to support the rider's feet and hips. We know the rider powers the pedals through extension of the hip and knee. Now we will look at the end of that kinetic chain by focusing on what is happening at the foot. Here we see what happens at the highly flexible foot. The arch and forefoot collapse under load. Keely is unweighting and weighting her right foot. As you see the arch and forefoot press into the ground, the tibia rotates inward and the knee moves in towards the midline. The combination of forefoot and arch collapse not only robs the rider of power, but can also be a significant cause of pain and injury on the bike. 
We can measure a rider's neutral, unweighted arch height by using the DFD or archometer. That will determine if the rider's arch is high, medium, or low. That way you can suggest the appropriate footbed with significant, moderate, or mild support. The right footbed will support the rider's neutral arch height, preventing excessive collapse and increasing efficiency while reducing the chance of injury. The correct footbed will also increase rider comfort by dispersing pressure over a wider area, thus reducing hot spots often felt under the ball of the foot. Here you see that with body geometry footbeds, the red, high pressure area under the ball of the foot has been significantly reduced. The forefoot also has the potential to collapse and cause the tibia and knee to dive in towards the midline. The big toe typically sits higher relative to the little toe, creating this angulation. 87% of rider's feet have some degree of varus angulation. 11% are neutral or flat, and 2% are valgus, angled the opposite way. Specialized body geometry shoes have a 1.5 millimeter varus wedge built into the sole of the shoe. This slight angle helps to keep the rider's forefeet from excessively collapsing when pushing the power to the pedals. We've just talked about properly supporting the foot. Now we need to properly support the pelvis. Remembering that proper support at both the foot and the pelvis will protect the knee. Saddle choice is a big piece of biomechanics. If we don't choose an appropriate saddle, we can definitely affect the biomechanics of the knee as well as increase the risk of injury and discomfort while losing efficiency. Using the digital sit bone device, you can measure a rider's actual sit bone width. This will help inform which saddle size will best support a rider's pelvis. Specialized has collected sit bone data from thousands of measurement sessions worldwide. Riders' actual measurements can vary greatly. In our studies, we have found a wide range of adult sit bone widths, falling anywhere between 8 to 16 centimeters. Interestingly, we found no correlation between overall rider size and sit bone width, meaning that short or skinny riders could have wide measurements and vice versa. The key takeaway here is not to judge a book by its cover. You can only know a rider's exact sit bone width by measuring it. No assumptions, no guessing. The goal of measuring a rider's sit bones is to suggest a saddle wide enough to fully support the pelvis. Elevating the pelvis above the saddle minimizes soft tissue pressure for safety and comfort. The goal of measuring a rider's sit bones is to suggest a saddle wide enough to fully support the pelvis. Elevating the pelvis above the saddle minimizes soft tissue pressure for safety and comfort. The right width saddle can also help keep the rider sitting squarely, so their hips are relatively symmetrical left to right. Asymmetry at the hips can lead to pain, discomfort, and injury at the knee, in addition to potentially losing power and efficiency while pedaling. Pedaling the bike is similar to setting up to do a squat in the gym. The rider will get the most power out of their hip when it is ideally aligned to maximize extension. A personal trainer guiding someone through doing a squat will tell them to push their butt back like they are trying to sit in a chair. This maximizes hip flexion, closing the angle at the hip. This elongates the glute musculature so it has a greater potential effect in extension, opening the angle of the hip. If a rider's pelvis is properly supported, they will be able to comfortably roll their hips forward when they lower their torso to get into the drops or when exerting a hard effort. When the pelvis can easily rotate forward because it is supported properly, not only can the rider comfortably lower their torso and close their hip angle, the rider will also achieve optimal hip flexion when the knee is at the top of the pedal stroke. This maximizes the rider's potential to use glute musculature through hip extension, increasing power to the pedals. Marcus is an extremely flexible athlete, but soft tissue pressure is not allowing him to roll forward on the saddle. His sit bone width is 150 millimeters. He has to clench every muscle in his pelvic floor to try and create a platform to sit on and thus cannot roll his hip forward to recruit more from his glutes while extending his leg through the pedal stroke. With the proper saddle, he is supported on the sit bones. He was able to rotate his pelvis, recruiting more extension from his gluteus and giving him more power. The fitter's goal is to have the rider sitting evenly on the saddle. If they're not sitting evenly, they could potentially hurt themselves or lose power during the pedal stroke. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison of the same rider on two different saddles, an aura on the left 
and a power on the right. On the right, she is sitting squarely on the more supportive saddle, evenly side to side. On the left, she is not well supported and has shifted over to the left. The markers on her back are off to the left of center. If a rider is sitting on a saddle that is too narrow or too wide or not the ideal shape, they will not be able to comfortably sit on both sit bones. Often they choose one sit bone with the other shifted and rotating forward, creating an unstable, asymmetrical position on the bike. This adaptation to the wrong saddle can cause lack of power, discomfort, and injury such as saddle sores, sore knees, a sore low back, or even a numb hand. In the image on the left, you can see the result of the hip shift. Her left knee is pushed forward and into the bike frame while her right is pulling out and away from the bike. On the right, she is properly supported on the correct saddle and her knees travel straighter and more symmetrically. Though if you look closely, you'll see not perfectly symmetrical, but it is closer to even. After taking this course, I hope you have a better understanding about how riders actually push power to the pedals. The ultimate goal of the retool fit method is to understand the unique needs of the individual through the pre-fit assessment and adapt their equipment and position so that they can optimize their power on the bike all while reducing their chance for injury.